This is Duke University. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and, and kick us off here. About um, six or eight months ago, Maha came to the Duke Islamic Studies Center staff to uh, propose a, a trip to uh, go in conjunction with the Levantine Arabic dialect course. Um, so there were three goals that we had established for this trip. The first would obviously be to practice the Levantine dialect with other people, um, which we all know, everybody here knows that this really drastically strengthens your language abilities when you're able to hear and practice speaking with other people that you don't normally see every day in the classroom. Um, the second goal was also to speak with professionals who have some similar backgrounds in Arabic. And the third goal was to uh, allow the students to take some sort of research component in their, in their trip. So all the students spoke to um, a couple of people at two different uh, embassies and also to a couple of people within the NGO sphere in DC and ask them a couple of questions about different areas of interest. And uh, the final goal, which is a little more ethereal, was to use this as a starting point to see what other sorts of projects we could, we could take on in the future. Um, and I think we were very successful in all four of those goals. Uh, all the students visited uh, three embassies, really, but shadowed at two, the the Lebanese and Jordanian embassies and visited the Kuwaiti embassy, um, which w graciously hosted us for a lunch before we left. Um, and they also visited uh, an NGO, Ashoka, and Al Jazeera. Um, now, not all of the conversations were in Arabic, but we were focused on kind of a holistic approach to language learning, um, which is definitely necessary when you're taking a, a handful of students who come to the language with different levels of knowledge, especially different levels of knowledge within the dialect. Um, and finally, I just wanted to tell everybody some notes that Kazat Wong, who came to the lunch, uh, wanted to pass on to you guys. Um, she wanted to strongly encourage everybody to apply for the CASA Fellowship. Um, and that's a one-year program that allows you to go to the Arab world. It's, it was previously held in Cairo, but now in Jordan. Um, and it's 100% paid for. And she found that it helped her exponentially. Um, she was able to spend a year there, which was a very different learning experience than the two months or um, even less than that that you might spend on Duke Engage or other various programs. Um, she also had some more general notes to share with everybody. She wanted to really encourage all of the students to reach out to people for informational interviews. Um, so you can go and ask them how they got to their job, um, if they like it, what were the best and most challenging things about their positions. And she also encouraged everybody to use LinkedIn as a tool to connect with Duke alumni. Um, and finally, she wanted to tell all the women who are studying Arabic to check out women's forums events because they were extremely beneficial to her. So those were Kazette's tips, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Brian. Um, I am a, a senior. About to graduate, very exciting time, and I get to kick things off. So, this is about is this half of our group, all of our group, uh, all of our group. <laughs> uh, and this was a, oh, this was a discussion panel um, where we had four guests: Ella, Sameh, Bima, and uh, Rema. And so I'm here to talk about Ella. So, excuse me. Ella, um, Ella was a Duke grad. She graduated in 2010 and studied Arabic and public policy. And honestly, one of the best things that we got out of speaking with her was learning about how to sort of navigate the world of um, think tanks. She works for, she's a research associate for uh, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Middle Eastern and African uh, Studies um, uh, section. And, you know, one thing that she said really helped her was that she was, she had the opportunity to take an unpaid internship. Um, what she said 
you know, has a, a negative connotation typically, but ultimately was really a valuable experience for her. And she, she highly recommended it for any students who might be considering the opportunity. And so in taking such an internship at um, CFR, it gave her the chance to sort of move up and find the position she's in now. And now, now that she has a few years under her belt, so to speak, she's able to help, you know, current Duke students, ones that are looking to, to graduate in the next few years. Um, she said um, more than once she's had the chance to, you know, grab coffee or, or whatnot with students who have come up to, to D.C. for the weekend. And actually one piece of advice uh, in addition that she gave was for any students looking to do so and that, that might be interested in, in meeting with any sort of representative uh, on the Hill, that it's really important to, to understand the formalities that are just sort of inherent um, in, in the area. A lot of times we become more informal uh, on campus with our professors and whatnot, but there's, there's sort of a, an unsaid formality there. Um, another interesting thing uh, relating more to her involvement with Arabic is that, so in her work she did say that she doesn't typically speak in Arabic full-time for all of her work, but she said that she does have the opportunity to read a lot of newspaper and a lot of um, pieces of information uh, in the Arabic language that are important to you know gathering a, a better understanding of what's going on um, in the region. And in particular, I find the, the the Shami dialect especially interesting because you know a lot of the formal um, higher up newspapers uh, are going to be obviously in in Fusha, but if you want to really read what you know, the, the things that maybe are a little bit more underground, the things that really reflect what the people are thinking, you know, it won't always be in the, the more general language, but in something that people feel more comfortable with. And I think that's one of, the, one of the coolest things about the language, is getting closer to the people and to the culture than you can with the sort of more informal fusa. So, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lance McClanahan. Um, uh, I, I'm going to present to you Sa Sama Alphonse. He was the uh, he's the deputy uh, representative for the Arab League in D.C. And pretty much his position on the panel was uh, um, to discuss the mission of of the Arab League in D.C. And specifically, he said that um, they were there essentially to create a bridge between the Arab cultures and the, and and the United States to give them an opportunity to better understand each other and better understand um, the capabilities of each other to share logistical um, uh, resources to present opportunities for uh, development both in the Arab world and in, in, in the United States. Uh, my, myself and another student, Courtney, had the opportunity to each ask him a question. Uh, Courtney asked him specifically how his how the Arab League's mission differed from those of embassies around the world and how they separated themselves and their mission from uh, the main construct of the embassy and what benefit uh, did it present uh, outside of that. Uh, he, he gave a very political answer and he didn't want to, uh, he didn't, at least in my opinion, he didn't seem to uh, want to show any connection between the two, but and to be quite honest, I didn't um, I didn't understand that where he was going other than the fact that he was trying to that the Arab League is trying to uh, un bring a unity to the all the Arab states rather than an individual Arab state. So it gave a broader range of representation rather than an uh, individual country. So uh, but it still sh shared the same essential mission of uh, creating a bridge between uh, host nations and uh, representative nations. My particular question was directed more so to the language concept and how um, <clears throat> how the, the formal uh, Arab, Arab representative um, was capable of representing these countries in a one particular language when there's multiple dialects out there in each country and as we all know, each Arab country seems to uh, be in a constant battle to kind of establish autonomy and uh, uh, individuality. 
Um, so my question was centered more on uh, if there was any problems associated with the uh, with the Arab League in representing these countries under one umbrella language and one umbrella organization. Uh, he he he, did, he said there wasn't. Um, he didn't have much to say else after that. He wasn't. Uh, later that night when we went out to a dinner, he kind of elaborated more on the fact that um, he, he felt that there are some pushbacks to one organization being, uh, there are some pushbacks to one organization re representing multiple Arab countries, uh, but for the most part, they feel that they're doing good work and uh, have a majority uh, approval rate um, for, for their mission uh, around the world. Any questions about that portion? Next is Mayada. Thank you. Hi, y'all. I am Mayada Major. I'm a junior. And um, so I got to speak with um, Dr. Dima Ayub. She um, is an associate professor right now at um, Georgetown University teaching Arabic. And um, she did her graduate work um, at McGill University, um, got a PhD in gender and women's studies. Um, so the first thing that I asked her about was, or what I asked her about was her interest in um, gender and queer politics um, in the Middle East, um, because that's kind of what she said her interests were in, and she sort of brought that in with Arabic literature and stuff like that. And um, so she, First off, one of the major things that was really valuable about what she said was just explaining how she combined her interests and her background as somebody who's bilingual um, and her her struggles with being bilingual. Um, and like just as an Arab woman, she wanted to combine those interests into her academic pursuits and into her career. And that's kind of what she why she chose to um, pursue a PhD. Um, and bringing in the um, kind of gender and women or gender and queer politics part of that. Um, she explained that she felt there was a huge misunderstanding, especially in the West, about the um, presence of kind of queerness and just representation of gender in Arabic literature and culture um, due to kind of colonial reasons. Um, and she had found that in kind of post-colonial studies, there wasn't very much um, inclusion of Arabic literature and correct interpretation of the, the Arabic literature just due to um, language barriers and cultural misunderstanding. Um, and she wanted to kind of contribute to clearing that um, those misconceptions up. And um, so Eric also asked her about her involvement in Jadalia, which is a um, like an academic e-zine that she has become an editor of. And um, she talked about how she um, wanted to use Jadalia as a vehicle to kind of bridge the gap between academia and the, the masses, I guess, um, in terms of bringing a more educated and um, in-depth view of um, the Middle East to more, a more public sphere. Um, and thirdly, she talked about her um, work as a professor, um, how she felt about just the curriculum and attitudes towards learning Arabic. And that actually, I thought, was one of the most valuable things was um, just her understanding that, like, first off, learning, learning this language is very hard. Um, and hearing a professor say that was very, it just, it was validating because it was like, okay, now I'm not, I'm not crazy and feeling this way. Um, but she, she, one of the things that stuck the most was she said that we should approach learning a language with humility and understanding that when you have to go back to the basics, basics of communication and you're not able to express yourself fully, you're not able to um, just communicate your thoughts to people, um, you should kind of settle with that, like with that vulnerability, and realize, okay, this I just need to go slowly with this. I need to be patient. I need to be humble with the fact that I I can't necessarily be all that I can be at this moment, but that doesn't mean that I can't eventually. So, um, just 
giving us kind of good philosophical advice with um, learning the language was really valuable. And next is Ramadan. <clears throat> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out. My name is Lawrence, and I'm a junior uh, in Maha's class. So at the Duke and DC office, we got the pleasure uh, to meet Rima Doden, who's the floor director for Senate Majority Whip Dick Durbin uh, from Illinois. Uh, and there were a few key takeaways from this meeting. The first is just hearing her story. She uh, uh, immigrated to America from the West Bank with her family when she was very little. And even from the age of four, she fell in love with US politics. She went straight into law school out of college and graduated from the University uh, of Illinois uh, College of Law in 2006. And uh, second, from there, we got to learn about uh, the daily needs of her work um, as the floor director for the Democratic Caucus. So she has to keep track of uh, the votes uh, from this caucus, and she has to um, uh, take stock in the caucus's daily needs. She's the one that has to investigate uh, Senate procedure and, and, and tell the representatives what's their best strategy for meeting uh, of their end goals. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, very, it's a very high octane uh, position. And what she was able to tell us um, is about uh, some of the whips uh, that she's had, she's had to work on um, that's, that's, uh, that has challenged her the most. Um, as a woman uh, coming to America from the West Bank, um, she uh, is proud that she's able to have such big impacts on US politics. She was at the forefront of, of uh, preserving tax cuts for the middle class in the past year and um, for working on negotiations uh, with, the, with the Republican caucus to, um, to allow uh, tax cuts for the upper class to expire. Um, and lastly, I would want to talk about uh, the key lessons that she was able to give to us as students of Middle Eastern studies and students of Arabic in this department. The first was that after college, she went straight into law school. And um, what, what she's been able to experience going straight into law school out of college is that there was a great opportunity cost in not getting work experience and making connections and networking. And she said that's where a lot of the potential and what we study lies. Um, when I was able to speak with her uh, uh, during our luncheon, uh, she told me that, that there is a lot of value in taking a year off after college uh, before you think about graduate school so immediately. Uh, one, because the job market is crazy what we're going into. And second, when you, want, um, when you want to pursue a career path, given what we study, a lot of those tracks say that they're in DC. You're working with NGOs or you're working within universities or within political parties. Uh, you need to network and make connections so immediately. Um, and she said that coming out of law school, that was a big race for her because she had years and years of lost time to make connections that a lot of her friends who didn't do that um, were able to make. So it's, it's, it's a problem that every student has to face on their own um, individually, um, but it was really great to get that confirmation that we don't have to constantly be racing to the next step, racing straight into law school, that we need to take a step back, think about what it is we want to do with what we study, and... Uh, Maybe going in, into work like she wishes she had done um, would be a, a, a better path. And then third, of course, um, a great thing we got to take away with meeting her was um, a great connection uh, to have uh, to work on the Hill. Um, you know, she's a big advocate for um, uh, increasing diversity uh, within the Senate. And um, she loves what we study. Um, and the perspective that taking classes with Maha um, and classes within the Ames Department, what that allows us um, to do as students, um, and uh, ha having her as a contact, um, even, you know, uh, for us looking uh, for jobs in the future, or even just for advice, um, is, is truly priceless. Uh, and that's Rima Doden. Uh, and next, um, we'll talk about the Lebanese Embassy. All right, take it away, my man. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Peterson and I'm a sophomore. Um, my portion of the presentation will be concerning our visit to the Lebanese Embassy. Um, this past summer I was very fortunate to be able to travel to Lebanon through Duke Engage. So when I found out I had the opportunity to meet with the ambassador and consul, I was really excited to increase my understanding of Lebanon. Um, 
Our main points of discussion are the war in Syria and the subsequent refugee crisis, um, Lebanon's political system, and the citizenship and civil marriage. Um, as you know, the Syrian civil war has placed Lebanon in a very precarious situation. Um, the country itself is very divided um, politically in terms of pro-Assad and pro-rebels. It's about 50-50 in rough figures. Um, recently, Hezbollah aligned itself um, Hezbollah is a, both a militant group and a recognized political party in Lebanon. I emphasize that it's a recognized political party because many people associate Hezbollah as being this just a terrorist organization, whereas in Lebanon, it has very sound um, political standing. But its involvement in Syria has further created or further exacerbated the rift between um, uh, Lebanese nationals. Um, when I was in Lebanon in July of uh, 2013, there was a car bomb that exploded in a Lebanese stronghold, uh, or sorry, in a Hezbollah stronghold in the southern district of Beirut. In, no or in August, there was another car bomb which killed dozens, and in November, another one in the same area. As you can tell, the Syrian civil war has created a lot of angst in Lebanon, both in terms of political violence and in terms of the refugee crisis. There are over 1 million refugees registered in Lebanon, um, according to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. This number is actually much higher, as there's hundreds of thousands that aren't even registered. Um, usually, these refugees are living amongst family and friends, and um, oftentimes do not seek help from the United Nations. Um, this, of course, has created a very, um, has placed a lot of strain on employment in Lebanon. Lebanon already faces very high unemployment. And as you can imagine, these refugees are willing to work for much lower wages, which in turn places um, a lot of Lebanese out of work, which in turn further increases the tension between these, uh, the Lebanese nationals and the Syrians that are residing there. The consul also mentioned a lack of international support, which I found very concerning. One thing that he told us was that if every nation took in at least 25, every Western nation or developed nation took in at least 25,000 refugees, it would help our situation immensely. And I also, when I was in Lebanon, um, I met with an official who told me, and I haven't confirmed this myself, but he told me that the United Nations has been placing a lot of pressure on Lebanon to take in these refugees that they simply cannot handle infrastructurally. One of the proposals that the consul gave to us was the creation of UN protected and UN funded refugee camps. But as of now, the UN has done nothing like this. In terms of the political system, um, every religious sect in Lebanon must be recognized or must be represented within the government. Originally, this was created um, in terms of fairness. Um, the idea was that in the wake of the civil war, if we give representation to every ethnic group and every religious sect, then we'll reduce tensions. But this is, hasn't been really the case. Um, in fact, it's more so that nothing get, has been getting done in Lebanese politics because these groups are constantly competing for their own personal interests. In addition to this, the president must always be Christian and the prime minister must always be Sunni Islam. As you can imagine, this would also create a problem as the two most powerful positions are assigned to specific religious sects. Um, the consul originally, um, uh, in order to further secularize the, secularize the government, um, brought up the idea of creating a um, non-religious seat in the, par in the Lebanese parliament. But in my opinion, I don't think this would solve the problem because it's still placing a religious label, whether it's non-religious um, nonetheless, it's still placing a religious label on um, politics, which I don't think should be the case. Um, the consul also mentioned civil marriage. Um, in 2013, Lebanon first acknowledged civil marriage within uh, civil marriages to occur within their own nation. Before, if a Sunni Muslim and a Shia Muslim wanted to get married, they would have to fly either to Turkey or Cyprus in order to get their documents. Um, as you can imagine, this would place incredible burden and probably um, increase the um, rift between the different ethnic sects as well. 
Um, but since uh, 2013, Lebanon has now recognized um, civil marriage, which the consul describes as the first step to the secularization of, um, secularization of government. Another thing, the last thing I'd like to mention um, regards citizenship. Citizenship in Lebanon can only be passed down by the father. So if a Lebanese woman marries a non-Lebanese man, their children cannot have Lebanese citizenship. The reason for this, um, well, there's, pro there's the main reason that comes to mind would be Lebanon itself is already very strained in terms of the amount of people that they have in their nation. Um, in fact, more Lebanese live outside of Lebanon than they do inside. So in my opinion, this is Lebanon's way of limiting the amount of nationals that they have to take care of. But as you can imagine, this is a very unfair system in terms of gender equality. Um, both men in the United States, both men and women pass down citizenship. Um, the consul didn't really elaborate further on this topic, um, but he also discussed the encouragement of getting Lebanese nationals or expatriates who are outside of the country to vote. In order to do this, they must register with the embassy in their respective nation. Um, but many of these Lebanese aren't doing that. So one effort that Lebanon has been doing um, has been actually going to um, gatherings uh, where these Lebanese, um, like uh, social gatherings or churches or mosques, um, in order to encourage these Lebanese to register with the embassy so they can participate in politics. Um, based on our discussion with the ambassador uh, and the consul and on my previous visit to Lebanon, I do think Lebanon is moving in the right direction. Um, recently, their civil war uh, just came to a close in the past, I believe, three decades. And as you can imagine, um, it takes sometimes half a century, if not more, in order to recover from such a devastating civil war that Lebanon went through. Um, in addition, the Syrian civil war has been um, essentially hampering all efforts of the government to get any of the Lebanese government to get anything done. Um, the refugee crisis has put great strain on Lebanon. Um, hopefully with the end of the Syrian civil war, uh, Lebanon can move forward in, um, in dealing with its domestic problems. But until then, um, I don't see um, any, any of these issues being resol resolved until the crisis in Syria is finally over. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Courtney Murray, and I'm a junior in the Ames department. Um, I, along with three other students um, and Carrie, went to the Jordanian embassy to speak with First Secretary Kais um, Biltaji um, and Dana Daoud, the director of the Jordan Information Bureau. Um, so the First Secretary has worked for 10 years in this position as the direct link um, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Jordan. Um, he follows and promotes Jordanian interests um, in the Senate mostly, and he, um, he highlighted his trip of staffers and politicians to Jordan every year um, as a way to connect the people that are staying in Jordan um, with the home country that they are uh, supporting. Um, Director of Information Dana Daoud um, mainly targets students and other populations to understand what's being said about Jordan, um, as well as um, to highlight the information that is coming from Jordan as well. Um, she also reports back to Jordan about perceptions of the U um, within the U.S. from either U.S. citizens or um, Jordanians living in the United States um, as to help them better create programming um, to um, protect Jordan's interests. Um, and they also, um, she works very closely with the think tank community um, in her work as the director of information. Um, so in our discussion, we talked about three main points. Um, I'll say this, that when I'm discussing these points, I'm going to tell you kind of what they said, um, the information that they gave us um, to our specific questions. Um, when we went in, we had a couple of sections of information that we um, researched, one being the water crisis, um, the refugee crisis that's similar in Lebanon, um, it's also in Jordan as well, um, for Syrian refugees. Um, economic strains and what's called known as the youth bulge, um, where there's um, a lot of more than normal um, in terms. There's a lot of uh, youth that are um, 
kind of getting to working age and coming out of college uh, with professional degrees, but there is no, um, they don't have the infrastructure for jobs. Um, so with that, we went into the Jordanian embassy with these questions. Um, and both the first sector, secretary and the director of information were really glad to, um, to give us some answers. Um, so when they were first talking about um, where Jordan is now, it was kind of their um, introduction to, um, to our visit. Um, they talked a lot about um, Jordan's status as a reformed um, country, that they have a reformed parliamentary government and constitutional court, um, and that the, um, His Majesty King Abdullah um, is one of the most reformed leaders in the Middle East. Um, they also spoke a lot about um, their digital diplomacy age that they are in currently, um, highlighting a lot of their top officials are on social media such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, to cl closer connect with citizens, um, understanding these issues. And um, first sec the first secretary highlighted this as a reason why they, um, their missions were going so well, at least through the um, consulate in the United States. Um, they talk we also talked a lot about the Syrian crisis, um, kind of in a twofold manner. Um, we learned a bit about Jordan's official position on Syria, um, and then we also learned about it as it relates to the um, economic strains um, with the refugee crisis now. Um, so officially, um, what um, First Secretary talked to us about, he said that um, that they wanted to avoid a partition Syria, um, and they're promoting a political transition with a legitimate strong opposition party. Um, he noted that Jordan was one of the co-authors um, on the Security Council resolution um, for um, increased humanitarian aid, allowing it to come through um, regardless of the fighting during the Civil War. Um, it's debatable whether or not it's helping currently that Security Council um, act, but it was, um, they were a big part in making it happen. Um, so in terms of the economic strains, um, as Eric talked about in Lebanon, this situation is very similar um, in Jordan. Um, officially, there are 1.2 million Syrian refugees in Jordan. Um, similarly to Eric, that's the official number there. Um, they're estimated to be um, at least um, hundreds of thousands more. 20% um, of those are in refugee camps, um, but as um, the Director of Information stressed to us is that most of them are not that they're integrated into um, Jordanian society. Um, Jordan, has, because of this, is extremely strained um, economically and socially. Um, unemployment was already high in Jordan um, for, the, um, for uh, Jordanian citizens. Um, and as was spoken about a little bit earlier, um, with the refugees, they'll, they're willing to work at a lower rate, um, furthering the economic strain of the, um, of the country. Um, socially, um, they, we talked a lot about um, how they, the refugees receive the same treatment as citizens and that they have access to the health subsidies um, and the education opportunities um, that are afforded to citizens of Jordan, um, thus also putting a strain on the system when there are an extra 1.5 million people um, to account for um, in terms of the their allotment of the budget. Um, so what we talked a little bit more about is um, how they work with the Ministry of Planning um, to upgrade the local community. Um, they vaccinated 83,000 Syrian children last year, or in the past two years, I apologize. Um, and that these, yeah, and that, and that international support is really key um, currently. They said that only, um, they only received 14% of the money that they had requested from the international community with the United States being their number one provider um, and that they're currently in a dire state and that they don't know where, um, where their, the money is going to come from for the infrastructure that they really need. Um, so in terms of the actual talk um, at the Jordanian embassy um, in the context of our class, I think we learned a lot um, in language wise as well as culture wise. Um, it was interesting because when we when we first walked in as a class, we were all kind of worried because um, I know Professor Mahad said, well, try to ask your questions in Arabic. Try to have them respond in Arabic and see how much you get. And um, I don't know about my, my colleagues, but I was very worried. <laughs> and 
but it, it was really helpful to at least try. Um, we all kind of worked together as a group to figure out how we could um, come up with our questions in Arabic. We'd all kind of come up with them in English, and there's some hard vocabulary words in there that we didn't really know from um, early uh, Levantine dialect. Um, but it was very helpful that the people that we met with, um, both first secretary and the director of information, were so open to helping us out. Um, so most times we'd ask our question either in Arabic or in English, however, however we felt comfortable. Um, but the first secretary would always respond to us in Arabic. Um, and he would, start the, he would start responding and kind of like watch our faces to see if we caught on. Every so often he'd, he'd say a vocabulary word and say, did you get it? Did you get it? <laughs> and we're like, uh-huh. <laughs> Until he, I think every so often he'd look over and wait for the, like, to see who has the most blank stare. And then he'd switch back to English and double check that we had um, covered everything. Um, which, yes, it did take twice the amount of time to um, understand the concept, but it was very helpful in that I feel like I really worked um, with my language at such a cool place. I mean, I don't know if I'd ever get another chance to go to the Jordanian embassy in, in the US, let alone um, speaking Arabic um, with one of their highest officials. Um, so I think that was one of my biggest takeaways from it, that um, kind of the things we've worked on over the past semester we were able to use in a limited manner, because um, obviously we don't um, sit and learn completely about the Syrian crisis um, using Levantine vocab. But we, we did know how to exchange pleasantries, do, our, um, do the basics of the conversation, and um, both of the people we spoke to were really, really happy about that. Um, they were excited to work with us, and I thought, for me, that was the best part of the trip, that I could use the language that I've been working on. Um, the spoken dialect as why we kind of started this class um, and was able to use it in a setting like this. So, this was Jordan. Hi, my name is Amber Watson and I'm a junior in the Ames department also. Um, so I'm going to talk about how on our last day in DC we were able to go to the Al Jazeera English and America office of the TV show, The Stream. Um, so just for a little bit of explanation, obviously Al Jazeera English is the more widely known network that was created in um, 2006. And they launched their stream TV show in 2011. But Al Jazeera America was just created last year in August and um, is a new TV network for Al Jazeera that is for, run for and by um, the United States, so is not viewed abroad at all. Um, so the main purpose of establishing this TV show, The Stream, was to create a social media community with its own daily TV show and not just a TV show. Um, so they really wanted to try and grasp the power of the social media to, in order to disseminate the news um, to Americans and to the international community. Um, and the way that they did this was through connecting their TV show to Facebook, Twitter, Google Hangout and Skype instead of satellite imagery that most um, TV networks use, I mean, news networks like CNN and BBC, um, to try and make it a more everyday um, lays person effect so that they're talking about um, issues that everyone is talking about on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, so we were able to meet staff from both Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera America, Jennifer Salon, who is the executive producer of Al Jazeera English The Stream, um, Malika Bilal and Wajahat Ali, which are hosts on um, Al Jazeera English and America, and then Rami Khater, who is the director of the digital department. Um, so what they first told us during our visit was the importance of gaining a unique perspective in the news network um, and how the, that they found their stories not just through um, everyday journalism tactics, but also to gain a story that gave the perspective that no other news network had gained before. Since for a lot of us, this was very helpful because we, don't, we didn't know the students that I was with and myself didn't know um, the underlying aspects of journalism. So gaining a unique perspective was something that we learned um, that could apply to any area of knowledge. Um, we also um, asked them about their successes and difficulties of running a news network in America under the Al Jazeera name. And that's something that they have indeed been struggling with 
um, because they, the Americans, I mean, in general, stereotypically are not very fond of the Arabic language. So um, trying to promote their news network um, and gain a larger following has been somewhat difficult for them, but is steadily growing. Um, and it, they're also, along with a revolutionary idea of creating a social media community through a TV show, are revolutionary in other aspects in that um, two of their co-hosts for, the two main co-hosts for Al Jazeera English are two females who are also a black and also one wearing a hijab. So just that aspect of them um, defying the heteronormative atmosphere of the news network is very interesting to see. Um, we also were able to get an inside look in the newsroom environment as um, Jennifer Salon gave us a tour of multiple departments, not just the stream, but also Al Jazeera America Tonight, Al Jazeera Min DC, and different types of TV shows that they have <laughs> and how they operate. And we were able to see how active the community was and how young it was. It was very youthful and a very diverse staff with different languages, different countries, um, which was really interesting to see in a work environment that I myself would love to be in. Um, and then finally, we talked about how Al Jazeera The Stream and Al Jazeera America related to the Greater Al Jazeera Network. Um, and she explained to us through the example of hashtag free AJ staff that they all support each other and work with each other for things like um, the recent problem in Egypt uh, a couple months ago where Al Jazeera um, journalists were arrested um, for violating Egypt's policy and slandering the president and things like that. Um, so they created a movement all together with all of their news networks and shows to do that. Um, we also were able to understand that there is no one path to get to your career and to get to a career of journalism. Um, Wajah Ali told us how he became a co-host of this network, which was he started from law school, similar to Lawrence's story, um, decided he hated law school, <laughs> and started just kind of building his own reputation um, on social media through a kind of entrepreneur outlook. Um, and Malika Bilal, who was also a co-host, went to journalism school and took the direct nor normal path. But just the comparison of the two is a very good um, lesson to see that you don't need to take the normal path and there are other ways to do, uh, to build your career. Um, and then for me, the most important um, lesson or advantage that we gained from this trip was the fact that somehow through Maha's and Carrie's connections at Duke, we were able to actually be in this Al Jazeera office, which is a huge news network in the Arab world, and we were able to get the contact information of these people um, so that we could email them, and they do respond because I've already emailed them. Um, and getting a network with that kind of access is something that's really going to help us for our future careers. So that's Al Jazeera America. And next is Ashoka. You thought you could get rid of me. I'm back. <laughs> uh, so we have the pleasure of going to Ashoka, which is... Uh, uh, and we have a comedian in the house. So, uh, and uh, Ashoka has launched the largest network of social entrepreneurs. And I asked myself uh, a couple of key questions. Questions like, what the heck is Ashoka? I don't know what that means, nor do I know what social entrepreneurship means. Well, I can answer the first question. Ashoka refers to an ancient Indian emperor from 269 BC. And social entrepreneurship, does anyone want to take a stab at this? What would the way social entrepreneurship might be? That was my response when they asked us that <laughs> when we went to meet with uh, the foundation. Social entrepreneurship refers to finding solutions for social problems. That's a very general, huge uh, umbrella. They could be economic problems, they could be uh, problems with business, access uh, to resources, environmental problems. Uh, but what Ashoka uh, uniquely does is they find individuals who are highlighting specific social problems around the world and who are coming up with specific plans to solve those problems. This is uh, one of the most competitive um, application processes I've ever heard about. So I think it's really great that we got to meet with them personally and I'm going to talk about it here today. 
So Ashoka represents over 3,000 social entrepreneurs uh, around the world. And uh, for example, uh, the founder of Wikipedia is an Ashoka uh, uh, representative. So what these individuals do, um, like the founder of Wikipedia, is they highlight a problem. So this man's problem was there isn't enough access to education uh, for free for people. Uh, so then he decides, well, for this problem, I want to create the space where people can access all kinds of education on any topic that, that they want for free. Um, and then through um, Ashoka, um, which takes months and months of, of an application process, um, they, I, they want to identify, are you really passionate about this? Do we think you have uh, the indicators to make your project viable? And then once they accept you, you have access to thousands of other social entrepreneurs around the world, to business contacts, uh, to potential investors, uh, to business advice um, uh, through, uh, through Ashoka. Um, to ask students, what did we get out of uh, meeting Ashoka? Well, first, I learned about an entire new field I never knew anything about, first. Second, we got an inside look on the application process to get to be a part of Ashoka, which is a very um, um, applicable path for what we study. We study um, I mean, I speak Mopei, so I, I study Middle Eastern studies, and, and I study this dialect uh, with Maha, and I even got to go to a summer with Maha uh, in Lebanon, and um, working with, uh, with NGOs on the ground, um, and especially with, with, with the refugee problems that, we're, um, that we talk about a lot in this class and in my work in Lebanon uh, with Maha. Um, Ashoka represents a really unique, incredible opportunity to use what I study here um, to make a career out of it. And by meeting with Ashoka, we got to learn about the, the application process. We got to learn about what indicators uh, they look for to make you a viable candidate. And lastly, that you only get to apply once. So it's really important that when you apply, so you know, potentially if I want to apply uh, to be a part of Ashoka, um, that I know I, because I only get one shot. But having this inside perspective of what they're looking for, um, that makes my ability to be a successful applicant enormously greater. Uh, and on top of that, like with a lot of the individuals we got to meet during this trip, we got great contacts. Um, I know that um, the two women we got to meet with through a children, whenever I have any questions, uh, they're there for us because it's not just that they know we're, we're kids and we're smart and we're working hard, but we got to meet them in person. After this trip, uh, to us, uh, and um, yeah. uh, the food. Um, and the bang, what do you think about? <laughs> well, until all, um, during the visit, I got to go and visit Dr. Mirza Hassan at the World Bank. Um, in my visit there, I got, he gave me, we talked for two hours, I was in his office, and he gave me an insight on how the World Bank functions, like what it's composed of, and I learned a lot. Basically, the World Bank group, a lot of people think the World Bank is one thing, there's actually a World Bank group, and the World Bank is one family of the World Bank group. There are four family, four family institutions. Um, the first is the International Finance Corporation, which provides financing loans to the private sector. Second is the International Center for Settlement of Investments, which works with governments to uh, to reduce risk, so if they see a government's hitting financial risk, they go and they talk to them, just give advice. Um, the third is the multilateral investment guarantee policy, which is, which Dr. Hassan actually stressed a lot during our thing. He said that it's like it's one of the reasons why that why people invest with the World Bank, like instead of with other institutions. And basically, what it is is that it it provides political risk insurance to investors who want to invest in developing countries but are scared. So it basically incentivizes investors to help get return and like help develop the world. Um, he told me an example of um, in, in Africa, one country invested in a country in Africa to build coffee farms and help like they get return and help develop the economy there. And a dictator came in actually and nationalized all the coffee farms so the country basically didn't get their investment return back. The, the, it was going into the dictator's pocket essentially. And if you invest with the World Bank because of this part, They'll, they'll insure, insure you, they'll pay you back your investment. And um, so it incentivizes people to help invest in developing countries. And the fourth institution is actually the World Bank, which is the biggest institution of the World Bank group. Um, their goal is to promote 
to, to reduce poverty and promote economic growth around the world. Um, and that's where Dr. Hassan works, and he explained to me how the World Bank functions. Basically, in the World Bank, there are 25 executive directors. Each executive director represents a country, a group of countries. Dr. Hassan is actually the, uh, he represents the whole Middle East as well as North Africa, except for um, Saudi Arabia. He's actually from Kuwait. And the World Bank was a perfect visit for me because I study finance and interest in economics, but I have family background in politics. And the World Bank kind of merges the two, the two um, fields. And actually, Dr. Hassan worked for the Kuwaiti Embassy and then moved to the World Bank. So he started in politics, then moved into finance. Um, so he represents the whole Middle Eastern region and North Africa. And he basically told me what, exe what the executive directors do is that every, every twice a week they meet, they all meet, and they basically talk about what projects should be worked on, how to allocate budget. The World Bank gets about like 30 billion to allocate each year on projects, and they basically get to decide in these meetings what country they think needs projects, what type of project, how much money should be allocated. Um, and I asked him, the, the biggest, the thing that I found the most interesting is that in these meetings, if you think about it, each executive director is from a country that represents countries. A lot of the countries need help or need development. So how they balance trying to have a bias between like trying to get projects in their country as opposed to the countries that actually need it. And that's the biggest goal, that's the biggest challenge and the, the, heart, the, the biggest challenge basically for the executive directors is to balance. Um, they represent not only their countries, but they also have to represent the banks the bank's needs. Um, he, he also got to give me some examples of projects that he works on, which were very interesting. He worked on one project in Yemen where he found that researchers found that girls were walking for, in the village, girls were walking uh, like four hours to get water there and back. So it was like eight hours, it took the whole day to get water. They built a well that was 20 minutes away from the village, so it basically took an hour to get water, and now the girls had free time. And now they needed schools, they built lower schools, they graduate middle schools and high schools. So basically his, his, his quote to me was that projects build on projects and that's how development occurs. Um, he also told me about a story he, he, um, he worked on in Togo in which people had to go around mountains. It took about like six hours to get around the mountain. They built a bridge instead where it took 30 minutes. So every day, every single person saves six hours every single day. So I mean the amount of development that comes, productivity, human capital from that is huge. Um, I, I just found, like, I didn't know much about the World Bank before, and I found a bit, like, I learned a lot during my, uh, my visit with Mr. Hassan, and I found it extremely noble and very interesting uh, how hands-on some, some of his work is, how helpful. And he, 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 I remember this quote he told me here, is that everybody at the World Bank who works there could be working on Wall Street, could be working in government high positions, but they truly believe in the mission of the World Bank, and that's how... Um, that's how you can succeed in the World Bank, and it's a very noble career. I'll end it right there. So, thank you. I'm going to talk about the Ammi. I want to thank you, and I want to tell you that this trip was important to you as much as it was important to me. So I'm going to go on with the Arabic now, with the English now. Um, first of all, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about the um, our visit to the Kuwaiti embassy. Um, so this is the last stop before we came back to Durham. And we were lucky that um, His Excellency, the Ambassador al Sabah, and his wife took very good care of us. Um, we were taken care of since before we even arrived, um, thanks to Talal. Uh, but also to the generosity and hospitality of the Al Sabah family. Um, we had our private chauffeur go out. Um, this is taped. Uh, so, um, and we also were, I was personally delighted to have a very um, serious yet very insightful conversation with uh, the ambassador, not just because I speak Ammiya but also because he uh, wanted to make it a point to share with me um, a few insights that I would, in my turn, share with the students. Um, so we were, we were very happy not just to visit the embassy and meet the Al Sabah family, but we were also impressed with the way the embassy is built and how the different rooms carry 
a special character. So one of the rooms um, is actually um, uh, the, the, the furniture in this room was bought in an auction. Um, it's a, it was antique Syrian uh, wood that was all over the walls. And even the door of that room was very impressive. So um, our visit to the embassy was, was amazing because it gave us all a sense of being in the Kuwait without actually being in the Kuwait. And we literally felt like kings and queens for a few hours. Um, so um, this was our last stop, and this is why no one wanted to leave. Everybody wanted to stay in DC, but not just in DC, in the Kuwaiti embassy. Um, so um, I want to, you know, I would like to thank a few people, and I want to give a final message to the students. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Shami Arabic class because I think that this trip was my first trip in the U.S. with a group of students. Of course, I expected um, a lot of accidents to happen, so I wanted to have a plan A, B, C, and D. Um, but then I was very surprised that, you know, they were taking, taking care of me. Um, so each one of you contributed to making this trip memorable to me. As much as I, you know, tried to make it easy on you and easy to communicate with the people that you met with. And I also tried to include as much variety in it and as many connections as I could. So on top of the list is each one of you in this class, because this is the first time Shami Arabic is offered at Duke, uh, but hopefully not, not the last time. And this is the first time we have such a trip, and hopefully not the last time. I would also like to thank Dr. Lee Baker's office, because they were the one who funded this trip. I would like to thank Kerry Majakis and Kelly Jarrett, who's not here, but DISC in general was like an amazing partner in this trip in preparing for it, in making sure that all the details were taken care of, and in making sure that you know we were on the budget and even have enough money for all the meals and everything included. Uh, I, the panelists that we met in this trip were from different backgrounds. So we were able to talk to an academic, a diplomat, a person from the NGO, a person from the Congress. Um, we were also able to meet with ambassadors, uh, the Lebanese ambassador, uh, a consul in the Lebanese embassy, and, uh, and you know high officials in the Jordanian embassy. Um, as some of you said, the Al Jazeera and other places opened their doors because they heard the name Duke. But I think that when you guys were there, you represented Duke so well that I would think that they would open their doors again and again. Um, I'd like to thank Julie Harbin and His Excellence, the Ambassador Patrick Dadi, who also came and visited our class before we went to DC to prepare us for the trip. Um, there, were, there was one alumni student who joined our trip, Emily Mendenhall, and a Duke graduate student, David Harding, uh, who also took an active role in the panel. I would like to thank Jennifer Stratton, who joined us and covered the trip and is with us today. And finally, I would like to thank the audience who came and attended today's presentation. Um, this is a very critical time of history for the Sham area. Um, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and, um, and a lot of neighboring countries, too, are going through a lot of um, changes. So for us to actually be able to access um, information firsthand from officials who sometimes give politically correct answers, but I believe in our trip we were able to get the answers that we wanted to hear and needed to hear. So for you guys to be able to access this information was very important. And I hope that you manage to keep those connections going. Thank you again. <laughs>